Welcome to GS Podcast number 90, brought to you by Audible. You know what it's all about. It's like a speaky book. Audio versions of some of your favourite works, some works you're yet to discover. Fiction, non-fiction. I think there's some speeches on there as well. Um, It's perfect for when you want to absorb new info, uh, be entertained on the move without having to sit down physically with a book in your hand. So you can go on the treadmill, in a car, stalking, whatever it is you do. I'm, I'm... I don't judge. Head over to audibletrial.com forward slash GS. That entitles you to a free 30-day trial and a free audiobook that you can keep forever, even if you decide you don't want to keep on with Audible services. If you don't think that's for you, I'm not sure why, it sounds sounds brilliant, uh, you can support the podcast by heading over to patreon.com forward slash G spell checker. And with that, it just allows you to say, I like your podcast, I like what you do, Uh, I'm going to give you a dollar for every time you release a podcast, or I'm just going to give you a dollar a month, or whatever you can afford. Um, You're in total control, you can set the limits, you can unsupport at any time, uh, but any support is really, really appreciated. I'm still harbouring delusions of doing this full time and earning a living from it i think it would just free up the extra time to keep my eye on theocrats and general regressive apologists i'd be able to write more things cover more things get to more events schedule more guests because i wouldn't be tied up for eight hours a day and i may even be able to produce some video content as well so if you feel like you want to help me achieve that dream head over to patreon.com forward slash gspell checker. I'm really, really pleased to have Chris Matheson back on the podcast for this episode. Such a really, really good guy. Um, Hilarious, very smart. Um, For those who are not aware of uh, who Chris is, he was on the podcast back in September. He's uh, an author from the States. Wrote the hilarious book, The Story of God, uh, a biblical comedy about love and hate. Uh, It's... It is, it is great, it is great. Um, it's a retelling of the Bible from the first person perspective of God and he just nails all of God's neuroses and outright insanity to be fair. Um, and I think that one of the most annoying things for Christians reading it is probably the fact that it is <laughs> theologically accurate. But the paperback version of his book is due out soon. Uh, and it's got a, an epilogue attached to it from Satan's point of view. Very funny. If you already have a copy of the book, you can actually get that just on, on in the Kindle store on its own. A couple of books, apparently. Um, if you haven't got the book, I suggest you pick up the paperback. Uh, I'm sure you can find that at Amazon. You may or may not be aware, Chris Matheson is also the co-writer of the Bill and Ted movies. So I pick his brains a little bit on that. Um, We get an exclusive update on the states of Bill and Ted 3. Chris doesn't do social networking. Like I say, he's a smart guy. Uh, But any feedback that comes my way, I'll do my best to pass it on to him via Raven or some other outmoded form of communication. And I actually have a couple of copies of the paperback to give away to my beautiful listeners. Signed copies, no less. So, hmm... What's the best way to do this? Okay, build an effigy of Jeremy... Co- no, I'm only kidding. Um, tweet out the link to this podcast and put the hashtag Give me a book, please. <laughs> on there. And just, just try and reside in the UK if you can. And I'll pick a couple of people at random. So tweet out a link to this episode. Hashtag give me a book, please. And I'll, uh, I'll pick a couple of people from random and I'll, I'll send a signed copy of the story of God your way. Um... What date is it? Okay, so we were on September the 30th. Competition ends 5th of October 2016. And keep up to date on the podcast at gspellchecker.com. Enjoy!
It's a great pleasure to welcome the return of Chris Matheson to the GS Podcast. Hello. Hello. How are you, sir? Um, very well. How are you? Yes, great. Thank you. Um, last time we spoke, I think it was this time last year, actually, and uh, we, we spoke about your hilarious book, uh, The Story of God, uh, a biblical comedy about love and hate. And uh, I, I really enjoyed it. And uh, I think, am I right in believing the, uh, the paperback's just on the horizon now? And there's some added content in there. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a kind of an epilogue that I... Uh, wrote that is sort of uh, a, a um, condensed version of the, all the the whole story, but told um, from Satan's point of view. Hmm. So, him observing uh, God, who he calls the old man, <laughs> and the old man's very very um, bizarre behavior, and um, it's written in first person, and and he's. Um, his sort of confusion about the old man and, you know, some potential insights into the nature of their actual relationship. Yeah. Satan kind of um, provides the voice of the uh, the rational observer, doesn't he, with the situation? He really does. I mean, he, he actually is, well, God's so irrational. Could you be more irrational? Could, <laughs> could, I mean, good luck writing a more <laughs> irrational character than God. I, I mean, I just don't think you could. I mean, take the biggest, you know, the most insane characters in the history of world literature, you know, take Captain Ahab and take, you know, Raskolnikov and, and take, you know, Macbeth and, and roll them all up into a ball. And you don't, you can't touch God in terms of his absolute irrationality and, and kind of insanity. And Satan is, um, for the most part, well, he doesn't show up that much, first of all. You know, he, he doesn't actually make, I mean, considering his reputation, um, his outsized reputation, he doesn't actually make that many appearances in the book. But when he does, he's pretty cool. And he's pretty, um, he's always pretty rational. Do you think Satan's just got bad PR then? You could look at it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Suppose you're only getting God's point of view on the man, aren't you? Maybe you just really misunderstood. You, I mean, we are. We're only getting God's point of view on this. And um, Satan is, we're just told that he's absolute evil. But on what basis is he absolute evil? Well, what, what exactly does he do that is so, so evil? You know, he tells, he tells Eve the truth, which is, you know, the old man was lying. You're not actually going to die if you eat that fruit, which of course is true. God lied. And then he, uh, tells God the truth, uh, or at least questions him in the book of Job and says, um, are you sure? Basically, you know, the question that's always going to just make God go insane. Are you sure? Or, or make any absolute authoritarian go insane. Are you sure about that? Could you be wrong? And of course, that, you know, that just blows God's mind. But of course he is wrong. You know, uh, Job does in fact, I mean, Satan's right. Satan does win the bet. And then Satan uh, presumably is given the job of tempting <clears throat> Jesus and he tempts him with shared world domination. <laughs> that, that's the temptation. We could we could rule the world together. That's a bizarre temptation, you know? That's really a bizarre moment, actually. That just like so many crazy moments in the Bible, it just goes by, right? You know, oh yeah, that's just that's the temptations. But why would he think that would work? I mean, it's kind of like offering the Buddha you know, like a cool penthouse on the Upper East Side, you know, like, wait, what? Why do you think he'd like that? I mean, on what basis would you even think? But we know that Satan is um, very gifted at temptation, right? That's what he does. That's his role. His role is to trick. His, his role, his bizarre role, his exceedingly bizarre our role is to trick the evil into being bad, right? <laughs> Which is stupid on the face of it, right? You don't need to trick bad. You don't, you know, you don't need to trick flies into thinking shit tastes good. You know, you don't, you don't have to do that actually. <laughs> it's uh, like you should try and trick the good people into being bad, not the bad people into being bad. It's unnecessary, but that is what he does. And, and so he's really good at temptation. 
So when he says that, you got to go, well, he's presumably on to something. Were you, uh, were you ever tempted to write a whole book from Satan's perspective? Um, probably not, you know, and, and what I bumped into is like the God perspective is really, um, it feels really kind of fresh comedically because like you're just really not supposed to do it. You know, like you're not, you're not, you're just not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to like be presumptuous enough to get into God's mind and, and, and suggest that he's, you know, sexually insecure and, and confused and, and muddled and, and kind of foolish. It, that's kind of, you know, I guess <laughs> blasphemous, I guess, is, is how that's been seen. Um, but Satan's pretty safe. So a lot of people, you know, like, I mean, John Milton did a, did a pretty nice job, I would say, of um, kind of telling Satan's point of view. So I ended up feeling like it's not, it didn't, it didn't have the same, didn't have quite the same charge, which is why I ended up giving it about, you know, one sixth of the length of the uh, larger story. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned there about God and being sexually confused. And that's, that's one of the things you, you play with in, in this epilogue section, especially, you know, um, feelings about um, being naked and the strange religious obsession with certain particular parts of anatomy. And, um, yes. and, and I think a lot of stuff uh, like a rational dogma in that point, Sorry, in that faith when talking like burning witches and things like that it's, it's been more or less universally discarded but these this obsession with sex and uh, nakedness seems to persist and I just wondered what do you think the whole obs- religious obsession is with this part of our lives you know I've thought about this one a lot like why what what is the nature of that and I don't know I mean I guess if you just sort of imagine yourself I mean I really don't know but my but you know all I've kind of done is speculate a little bit. Um, but I imagine a tribe in, you know, the Middle East, whatever, thousands of years ago, and they're trying to survive. I mean, that's all they're trying to do. And they're living in a really, really rough part of the world. And there's a lot of, you know, it's really dangerous and it's hard to survive. And every new mouth to feed matters. Every new, <clears throat> every new mouth to feed, like the whole tribe is kind of like responsible for and they're all part of it and therefore they all kind of have they're all invested <clears throat> in that and the leader you know uh, in particular is kind of like lording over like that <clears throat> you know that that question like who you know birth and procreation now why they're so obsessed <clears throat> with homosexuality which is a natural form of birth control that's a whole other thing. They they seem to you know they. But anyway, going back for a second, I mean, nudity is really dangerous, right? Nudity is super dangerous because nudity leads to sex because bodies are exciting, <laughs> and people are going to have sex, and people are going to have children, and that's potentially really risky. Um, and they and maybe you want to control that. Um, if I'm right about that at all, and I may be totally wrong, but <clears throat> the homosexuality thing is is a different thing because what exactly is the risk? of homosexuality. Why are they so freaked out about homosexuality? Why does God say that, you know, bestiality, I mean, bestiality is also (laughs) natural birth control, I suppose. It's very rude to the goats, but, you know, it is natural (laughs) birth control. Um, But bestiality, God terms perverted, like, okay, yeah, well, I mean, honestly, from a personal standpoint, I would agree with that. It's pretty perverted. But he calls homosexuality abhorrent, so I, I think abhorrent is worse than perverted, you know. I think, I think by definition, abhorrent is, is, is a worse, you know, term to have thrown at you than, than perverted. Yeah, I'd agree. Um, and, like, why they're so free? I mean, they seem to just be so obsessed with their own, like, maleness, you know, their own, like, um, like anything that threatens their own sense of, of their own masculinity and power is just deeply, deeply threatening to them. Yeah. I mean, one of the the great themes of religion is how oppressive it is to women in general. And I really liked what you did in your book and uh, of, of highlighting that and God's complete 
disregard for women to the point where we can't even actually remember the names of the various the various people that that pop up and in the epilogue as well you touch on something really interesting that i hadn't considered so given god's loathing for women in general you you asked kind of asked the question from satan's point of view why did he create women at all then why not just create uh humanity as a, a purely masculine strain of life yeah I mean, why, why did he? I mean, there's that very peculiar moment in, in Genesis. He creates human beings twice, basically. And the, and the, and the second time, I think, he, he pulls Eve out of uh, Adam's, he, he, he clones her, essentially, out of Adam's rib, which is a very, you know, strange approach, actually. But the first time, Male and female both emerge from him. And, and again, it's another one of these very important moments that just goes by. And, but if you stop and you, you go, so wait, so the feminine, so what are you exactly? I mean, you contain all things. You contain all femininity. You must contain all femininity. And yet, you hate femininity, like you're a very confused character. You're a very self-hating character. You hate half of what you are right from the get-go. And w- yeah, why not just create a bunch of men, you know, uh, handsome, uh, well-endowed men, you know, with perfect balls to, you know, wear <laughs> little shorty white robes and have God tattooed on their forehead and big block letters <laughs> and let them do some gardening, you know, and, uh, and stay virgins all their life. I mean, why not? I mean, that seems to be what he wants. Yeah. Why, why does he create this reality that is so endlessly frustrating and maddening to him it, that that is the ultimate question i think and it it comes down to just this profound self-hatred the book's been it's been out for a, over a year now and i was i was wondering i think last time we was on a, a sort of asked you what the response had been like and given this more time passed has, has anything interesting come your way any any death threats hate <laughs> g- general general disgust <laughs> general disgust i'm sure um i don't do social media so i'm not i'm not really accessible to whatever um you know might come my way in 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 that way so um there's that and so far um fortunately no i haven't you know found like a a dead you know chicken on my doorstep (laughs) or something or or blood smeared on my front door or, or or anything like that so far okay good to hear so i mean it's really interesting that you don't dip your toe into social media and um it's probably wise is there's a there's there's what's become a, a quite large outrage culture online now where especially for people who are in your line of business who who tell jokes who push boundaries and deal in taboos and it can become a bit of a witch hunt and so i mean i'm obviously i appear i mean i understand i'm not really selling it to you here but have you ever considered dipping your toe in them, that world at all um with the world of social media yeah no <laughs> <laughs> you're a smarter man than no, most every time i go and i take a look at it Stephen. I think that's not for me. No, <laughs> that is not for me. I couldn't handle. I'm. I'm too like sensitive, thin skinned. I think, and I'm too. I'd. I'd get scared. You know, I'd be like, oh my god, oh my god, that's really. I can't even stand it. Like when I read, like like um, you know, Peter Bogosian is a friend of mine, and um, so Peter will share with me some stuff that he gets, and I'm like, oh my god, how do you <laughs> deal with that, man? Like, wow, the bile and uh, the rage is pretty intense and i just don't think i've got the constitution you know yeah i mean it's it's a double-edged sword really and it's, it's a fairly new thing in terms of human communication so i don't think we all quite know how to handle it just yet so there's that line between like you just mentioned peter bogosian there who's a friend of the podcast great guy I'm, i like him yeah. i like his work a lot so i without social networking i never would have probably discovered his work and formed a relationship with him but I probably wouldn't have had a hundred messages calling me a prick either. So it's it's how do you <laughs> so how do you balance that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, it, in terms of uh, comedy writing, and, and like I said, it, it is one of them areas that probably does tend to get you in more trouble than most because if you can't laugh at 
serious topics and taboos. There's not really much point to comedy, in my opinion. And I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the state of academic institutions in America at the moment. I, d- I don't know if they're really... There's this kind of a self-censorship there and a, a, an offence culture. It, it seems like it's unacceptable to cause any eff- offence. We're having <coughs> speech codes on campuses. And I just wondered how do you think that's affecting your line of work, writing, uh, you know, expressing ideas with comedy? Is, is it going to create some sort of echo chamber eventually? I don't know, you know. I mean, I'm not – I mean, Peter is a, is a professor, you know, so Peter really experiences this. He's right on the front line, and and he he would have uh, a lot to say about this. And and I think a number of people who are in the um, atheist world and you know pretty uh, play a, a pretty important role in the atheist world are, um, you know, they're they're also members of academia, and so. They have um, very specific firsthand experience of of what you're talking about. I don't really, you know, I mean, my daughter just graduated from college and she graduated from a pretty liberal college. And so I definitely got glimpses of like, you know, safe spaces and, and trigger warnings and, you know, those kinds of things. And she kind of rolled her eyes at them and thought they were, <clears throat> on the one hand, sort of, um, ridiculous. On the other hand, my daughter is a very, uh, generous natured, um, uh, young woman. And I think she felt like she understood where they were coming from in some respect and, and what the, some of the underlying ideas were, um, what this is going to do to comedy, uh, it's hard to say. I don't think you can really, I mean, ultimately comedy is just such a powerful force, you know, it'd be like, I mean, it's just, it's such an unstoppable force, especially where it really got rolling and started, which is, you know, that's you guys. I said that to you last time. That's you guys. You guys did this. You guys own it, man. It's like, it's English. Comedy is English. Comedy is and it's, you know, I mean, not, you know, okay, go way, 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 way back. And, and, and I guess you could say it exists in the, in the ancient world, <laughs> you know, to some degree, if you think, you know, Aristophanes is funny and, and then you're in a club of like five people on earth, if you think Aristophanes is funny or, um, but like it's, 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 it's English and it's a powerful, powerful force. It's a powerful river and it runs th- through the United States now, um, really, really strongly. And I don't think that these kind of acute political sensitivities, you know, of the moment, um, are really going to have, uh, a lasting, a lasting effect personally. That's my view. Do you think comedy should have boundaries? Do you think these areas that it should leave alone? Are you, are you worried about offending people at all? No, I don't think comedy should have any boundaries. I mean, I mean that's that. No, not at all. No, comedy is meant to go um, everywhere, and theoretically, there are great jokes to be made about anything. You know, including the most horrible, dark. Um, things. Um, It takes supreme skill to make those jokes, to go to those places. Like anybody can, I don't know, anybody can do basic observational comedy. Anybody can make jokes about, you know, whatever, um, the obvious stuff, the way, you know, old people behave or the way, you know, uh, stupid advertising on television or, or the really super low hanging fruit. <clears throat> anybody can do that or anybody with, you know, with like an ounce of uh, comedic sensibility even um, can do that stuff. And then you go higher, uh, you know, then you get to the harder stuff, the stuff that's not low hanging, the stuff that's, that's, that's harder, but it's, it's, it's there. It's there. It's just, it's how do you do it? I mean, Kafka, I would say, is some of the darkest um, comedy ever made, and it's about death, and it's 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 about meaninglessness, and it's about absolute 
you know, the terror of existence. And then, or how about, you know, how about Lewis Carroll? You know, it's about wanting, in my view, anyway, it's about wanting to rape and murder a child that you're obsessed with. That's what it's about. I mean, that's what Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass are are about. He's obsessed with a little girl. He's sexually obsessed with a little girl. Okay, that's pretty bad. You know what I mean? Most people would say, yeah, you know, that's pretty bad. And he makes the greatest piece of comedy ever created out of it. Well, he's a supreme comic genius. I think he's the greatest comic genius who ever has walked this planet. I really do. Um, but that's to say there's nothing that you can't. You can't. It's not joking. I, I, joking's a really bad word. Joking's a really trivial word in my view. It's play. You can play with anything. Everything has play. And if it doesn't, well, it should. You, you know. And people who don't want to play, people who aren't willing to play, people who are like, no, that's bad. That's. I mean, that's really a giant problem with religion in my view. Like, no, this is off limits. No, you may not talk about this. No, this cannot be – you cannot make fun of this. You cannot play with this. Well, it's not true, first of all. And they make themselves really big fat targets – and they're they're just hurting themselves because we all need to play. That's what we need to do. That's the lesson that you know. That that's that's essentially, in my view, the lesson that the English have taught the world. We need to play. We need to laugh. No, it's beautiful. It really is. If you I mean, if you had our cuisine, you'd feel the same about needing to laugh. <laughs> yeah, you got to make up for it somewhere. Right? <laughs> and you know, I just want like. Because I'm I'm really very interested in in comedy, obviously, and therefore I'm interested in English comedy. Because if you're interested in comedy, you're interested in English comedy. And there's a moment, and I don't know if I talked about this last time, so I don't want to like talk about it too much. But there is a moment in the Canterbury Tales, which I think is the beginning. It's the birth of comedy, and it's not like the fart jokes, and it's not the you know the ass jokes, and it's not those. Those aren't funny. Those are lame. You know, those are just crude. There's a moment where Chaucer makes fun of himself, where the book where he the the book turns on him, where other characters start making fun of him for being this kind of effeminate little elf of a man, and they demand that he tell a story, and he starts to tell a story. And remember, this is Chaucer, right? He wrote it. He's <laughs> mocking himself. He starts to tell a story, and it, which is terrible, by the way. It's really bad. It's the worst story in the book. And then they basically are like, shut up. That's a terrible story. And oh my God, there you go. There you go. 1390 <laughs> or whatever. And the man has created comedy. Well, I mean, I think to an extent as well, I mean, comedy's it's purposely um, divisive, isn't it? I think you don't you don't always want everybody to find the joke funny. You want a certain kind of person to find a joke funny. I mean, do you have um, do you have Christmas crackers in the states? Do you call them that? You know those things that you pull at Christmas and you, you a little bang and you get a toy in and a, a little party hat. No, you don't have I've them. never, I've never even heard of that. Actually. They might, they may have a different name. I'll look it up later. But it's essentially it's, they're usually made out of card, and you, you pull them, and there's a little bit of like a gunpowder thing, and it explodes, and you get a toy and a Christmas hat, and there's usually uh -huh. there's usually a joke in there. Now the jokes are notorious for being absolutely appalling <laughs> jokes. Now I actually read uh, something a while back. I'm not sure if this is true, but it's, it makes sense. That I read that they actually purposely make them horrible. So that the the entire family can enjoy in the collective groan of knowing it's horrible, because the idea is if it's cutting edge satire, some people won't get it and it'll alienate people, certain people within the family dynamic. And I, I just I, I found that really interesting, and I yeah. I, I kind of think do you, do you write things where you you think I want everybody to find this funny, or do you want a certain kind of person to appreciate it? Well, you know, when you get right down to it, you just you just write what you think is funny yeah. because that's all that's all that's all you can do. Um, and if you try to if you <laughs> the idea of trying to write something like I want everyone to think this is funny, what the hell would that even be? <laughs> you know, I mean, I guess the closest would be like silent film comedy. You know, it would be like yeah, something slapstick. like Chaplin or or Keaton. You know, something to that. You know, in that vein, maybe. But the stuff that's no, because if you try to make everybody laugh, it just feels so sweaty. 
Hmm. It feels so desperate. It feels so, you know, kind of like um, needy. And comedy can't be needy. Comedy has to not give a shit, you know? Hmm. Comedy has to, like, not care whether you like it. Because if, if, if the person who's making the comedy cares whether you like them, okay, well, it's over. You know, it can't be funny. No, it's just like, it's... I mean, Gervais is really, is he's really good at that. I mean, Gervais is really, really mm. great. I mean, Gervais is really one of the 10 funniest guys walking the planet. I mean, by, for sure. That guy's really super, super funny. And uh, he doesn't, I don't think he gives a shit. I mean, does he want to be liked on <laughs> some not. level? I mean, I'm sure he wants to be liked on some level because, you know, he's a human being. But... It doesn't dominate his comedy. He doesn't. He doesn't seem to care. He doesn't give into that. And if you try to make something that, like, every, I mean, really, Gervais is uh, like in um, extras that show uh, when the whistle blows. You oh know, yes, you've seen. I mean, that's Gervais basically showing us this is comedy that everybody's supposed to think is funny. And, you know, it actually is funny because he loves it so much and he's sort of commenting on it, but it's horrible. You know, it's absolutely, it's so broad and cheap and, and obvious. Okay. Well, going back to what you were saying about extras, there's something really funny there with when the whistle blows, because it's, it was almost a premonition. Uh, cause several years later, quite a bit later, there was a TV show made called Mrs. Brown's Boys in yeah. the UK. I'm not sure if you've heard of it, but it's it's massively popular. It was cleaned up awards. They, they tour it live and fill stadiums. And it's essentially when the whistle blows, it's a man yeah. dressed as a woman. It's silly catchphrases. It's wink, wink, innuendo. Uh, and it, it just recently <laughs> won... I think something uh, like the best comedy of the 21st century in the UK, and it's baffling. And I, I mean, I, I spend a lot of my time attacking religion online and poking fun at it. Got quite a response when I poked fun at Mrs. Brown's Boys, which is interesting. <laughs> Say what you want about religion, but do not make fun of that show. But if you get a chance, type it into YouTube, and you 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 think it's almost a when the whistle blows style parody. It's incredible. So, I mean, I, I appreciate uh, what you say about the Brits and, and comedy, but we uh, we have some dark spots, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, yeah. Listen, you know, I, I mean, I also kind of grew up, I mean, I grew up watching Python, you know, who I loved. I mean, I loved it. I thought it was just, I thought it was just brilliant, you know. But I also remember watching Benny Hill when I was a kid, because they showed that in the US. And I, that I was kind of baffled by. Like, I don't quite think this is very funny at all. This just seems really kind of crude and dumb to me you know um so the, the, even even as a kid i kind of thought that right okay well, maybe it's great maybe i'd watch it now and i'd be like benny hill is just like ahead of its time and i didn't appreciate <laughs> it when i was 14 years old that could be that could be the case who knows okay well i mean last time we spoke i think i uh touched on the idea of uh whether or not you'd had any thoughts to approach any of the other holy books in the same manner and is that something that's interested you at any point yeah i think it's i think it's got to happen you know what i mean it's like i finished this book and i was like well it's not over is it you know the thing is this guy this god guy he continues on his story rolls on and it gets told three more times so uh you know, obviously the Quran is the next one in line, and that's a really that's a really tricky one because mm. you know you got people running around, you know, th waving their weapons and saying, "If you make fun of us, we'll kill you." You know, and um, <laughs> so of course yeah. I do notice that, <laughs> and yet how can that possibly work? I mean, what? I mean that? How can that possibly? work? I mean, that, that just, that can't work anyway. So yeah, there's like, he continues on through the Quran and then after a gap of, you know, a thousand plus years, he pops up again in the book of Mormon, same guy, same character, you know, and then after a gap of another hundred years, he pops up again in this sort of completely loony 
you know, space alien version of the Bible called Urantia. Same guy. So, like, I, to, in my mind, it's like, well, the story is half told. There's more to tell. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I find Mormonism particularly fascinating because I suppose, in a way, Christianity then. Um Islam, you can say, you know, their prophets are, are, are part of the past, the historical aspects that can't be verified. Yet yeah. Mormonism was born in the pure light of day of historical records. I mean, we can trace yeah. the back, the founder, and we can point quite clearly to the fact that Joseph Smith's a, a complete fraud. Yet <laughs> people still buy into it. And uh, what, what do you think stops them from seeing it the way we see it? I know I was just like I was just thinking the other day like Mitt Romney yeah. believes this book. Mitt, okay, uh I you know th- you can think whatever you want about Mitt Romney, you know, like I don't I I didn't like him and I don't agree with his politics and I was very happy that he didn't win and but Mitt Romney's not dumb. You know, you don't look at Mitt Romney and you go, "Oh, he's just a dumbbell." No, he's not a dumbbell. But he's a very very faithful Mormon. And this book is is laughable. I mean, almost on the face of it, this book is laughable. It's like a be- it's like a joke version of a religious text. <laughs> I mean, the other books all have something. I mean, the Old Testament, in fact, is really great. The Old Testament really has a lot of beautiful literature and it's crazy characters and amazing story. It's really in in places super fun. And the and the New Testament's like got some very sad and moving things because Jesus is a is a pretty compelling character on the page especially in the the gospel of Mark in my opinion and the Quran I don't know you know it's hard for me to really embrace the Quran but I you know people say it's very poetic and I guess mm. I kind of get it at times it's sort of rapturous about um nature you know it's a little bit more open to nature and a little bit. And so it's, I guess it has beautiful language. The Book of Mormon is just so, is so <laughs> bad. It's so bad. It's like suddenly God's become a really terrible writer. Like whatever writing skills he had, they're all gone. He's a terrible <laughs> writer. The characters are terrible. The structure is terrible. The ideas are stupid. The like when he happens to just bump into some, you know, like metaphor, or, he just kills it. You know, he'll just like for 20 pages, he'll talk about a, you know, a vineyard and you just be like, dude, we get it. We got it. The first sentence. Oh my God, this is the most belabored allegory of all time. Um, he misspells words, you know, it's just, it's atrocious. So yeah, why do people believe it? I think they believe it because it works. It doesn't matter. It's, it's William James stuff, you know? It doesn't matter whether it's true. That's not the point. It's not whether it's true. It's almost patently untrue, I think, if you use your brain. I, I wouldn't even, I'd take almost. It's patently untrue. But that's not that it doesn't matter because Mormons and I, you know it's like you grow up in the U.S. You grow up in the Western U.S. and you know you interact with Mormons. You know Mormons. I, I've known Mormons. Um, not I've never been friends with a Mormon, but I've gone to school with them. I've interacted with them. I've crossed paths with them, and they always have this kind of weird. <laughs> they're like some weird joke version of Americans from the 1950s. You know, it's <laughs> like they're just. It's bizarre. It's like, how, what are you guys doing? You know, because they don't drink and they don't smoke and they're really clean and they donate their money. You know, and they're really community oriented and they're really like they're like the they're really like the Osmonds are are were the perfect representatives of them. And of course, the Osmonds I think ended up having like pill problems and stuff too. And I think pornography usage is higher in Salt Lake City than anywhere oh, that's in the country. So something's got to give, right? Something's always got to give, but. It seems to work for them in spite of, you know, how incredible, like monumentally jaw-droppingly dumb it is. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. And you wonder, I mean, we've had the the prominence of Scientology in, in recent history and you wonder, is there any room left for the birth of n- new religions? Do you think we'll see something else in our lifetime? What, what comes next? <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't you just love it, Stephen? Oh, God. Wouldn't that just be, from our standpoint, just a glorious thing to behold? Yeah, like a new one. a new. I mean, you got to figure at any given point, right? Like, as we speak, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of people on the planet 
desperately trying to come up with the next one. But, you know, the thing is, you got to be Muhammad or Joseph Smith or, or, or like um, Moses to pull it off. You got to be this oversized person. You got to get lucky, first of all. It's got to be the right moment, but you've got to be this super charismatic kind of genius of a sort to with unbelievably huge balls you know the audacity to do this thing of like okay i'm now going to present to you absolute truth and you're going to believe me you know i've i'm the conduit for absolute truth and people fall in line and go yes right good we you know that's a very rare person, but you know people are trying to do it right now. You, you touched on Mitt Romney then, and I'm not sure how keen you are to get into politics, but um, as an outsider looking at this current um, presidential race, <laughs> I'll be honest, that a lot of us are quite nervous. And I was just, yeah, <laughs> just, a lot of us are too. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Are you looking at houses in Canada at the moment? What's, what's the deal? Uh, you know, I think... There's a, a lot of us that are very, very nervous about this and very worried about this and uh, sort of stunned, in fact, um, that this guy is even within um, range of Hillary Clinton. It seems to speak to some really big things. I mean, people don't dig her. There's that. Yes. Right? She's, she is not a good presidential candidate. She might be a decent president. I'm, I'm optimistic that she will be. But they don't and, – and the thing of being the first woman president, that doesn't seem to have really caused a lot of excitement. You know, She doesn't really seem to excite anybody. And she seems like part of the past, and she seems like part of this, you know, really the system, capital S system. Yeah. And people don't want, they don't like the system. And, you know, Bernie Sanders, of course, touched on that. And then he, look, I mean, at this point, I think we have to sort of, you know, I, I remember reading, um, somebody was like talking about Trump and, they're, uh, and they were using um, basketball as a way of talking about him. And they were saying, sometimes you play against somebody and they're good, right? They're good. They know they know how to play, but and they they score points on you, and and they can compete, and they're they're really good players. But they play basketball the way that the game of basketball is usually played, and so you figure them out, and eventually you can play with them. And then sometimes, and they're talking more like pickup games, I think. Somebody comes on the court, and they're not dressed right. And they're wearing, you know, wrong, the wrong shoes, and they're they don't look like a basketball player at all, <laughs> and and they and they're like unstoppable for a while because they don't you can't guard them, you don't know what they're gonna do, they don't play the game the way it's ever been played, you know, the way anybody else plays it, and so there's something just sort of like what you know, and eventually, it wouldn't work anymore, right? Eventually, it wouldn't work. But what's eventually in this case, you know, because that obviously trumps that basketball player, the one where it's just like, what the hell <laughs> is this guy doing? <laughs> How did you what get in? On? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, is he revealing some really ugly parts of the United States? Yeah, absolutely. Is it actually surprising to any of us who live here that those parts exist? <laughs> hell no. Hell no. <laughs> we live here, you know? I've I've lived in Red America more or less for the last 25 years. You know, I mean, I live in the land of more, pretty much like, you know, um, pickups and, and American flags and, you know, evangelicals. And so, like, it's, there's a, that's a big part of this country. It really is. Yeah, I mean, I, I can appreciate people's... Um, concerns about Hillary and uh, you, you know I could even sign off and say all oh, the concerns are legitimate but surely the answer is not Donald Trump and how can the answer it, like what is the question that the answer is Donald Trump you know it's like that's an interesting question you know that where the answer could actually be Donald Trump um, I don't know do you do you guys like look at it and go ah Shit, they're just doing a Brexit. Anyway, <laughs> they're Brexiting. We think it's one big in joke that you're gonna own up to eventually. Um, <laughs> it's we hoping a so? huge piece of like conceptual humor yeah. that the Americans. He's, he's essentially your your version of Borat. I think he's the one the, the greatest written satirical char uh, character 
ever conceived. I think that's how we look at it. <laughs> you know, uh, we could only wish. We <laughs> could only wish that was true. Although the crazy – look, this is really a bizarre thing to acknowledge about this guy. He's got a wicked sense of humor, yeah. right? He does. If you're a comedy person – and my friends and I have talked about this – you know, obviously we're all Hillary supporters, but she's such a drag, right? She's so boring. She's like, from a writer's standpoint, she'd be the most boring character to write. You'd be like, oh my God, I dread writing every scene she's in. There's just nothing fun to write. And then this Trump character pops up and you'd be like, all right, here we go. <laughs> here we go. This guy's so much fun to write. And he's funny. He's got, you know, like he got, ma- I don't know if you saw that little bit where he's like, get that kid out of here. You know, oh, yeah. did you see that I thing? did, yes. I mean, of course, and it's totally wrong and it's totally transgressive and it's totally anti politics. You don't say, get the kid out of here. <laughs> and yet, it was funny. I mean, he's he's wickedly funny too. And that gives him a weird kind of power against this very humorless candidate. Very humorless. Yeah, I mean, it's scary in a way because I don't think there's anything he could do that their his own supporters would be like, oh, that's that's a step too far now. Now, now I see what everyone's been trying to tell no, me. I don't think so. I think that 40% that likes him, there's really nothing he could do at this point. But there are people, clearly, like when he went after you know, the parents of the dead soldier, yeah. that did hurt. And so there are things he can do to lose the, let's say, I mean, I never understand these people, but the five to 10% of people are like, you know what? I don't really know who I'm going to vote for. You know, it's like, you don't know. You're not (laughs) sure. What on earth are you doing? How can you not know? It's so, it's such a stark choice. I, I don't even get them, but they're, you know, they're, they are. They swing, but, you know, it's like, well, now I like Hillary. Well, or now I hate Hillary more. Now I hate Trump more. He can offend them. It's going to be very interesting. I think that's that's for certain. Um, a lot of people will, will know you uh, for co-writing the Bill and Ted movies. And uh, these, these uh, the third one that's been... So it's almost taken on mythical properties of its own, <laughs> I this, know, this third yeah. movie. Maybe this will be the new new religion we speak of. <laughs> yes. Um and I think last time we spoke, I think that you, you completed a script and you were just looking to get it off the ground. Is there anything you can tell us about that? Anything new? Yeah, you know, we're we're like we're doing a major rewrite for a studio now, so it's you know it's like actually um, in a real uh, development, heading towards being turned into a movie. You know, so does that mean it's going to start filming in a month? No. It doesn't mean that. It means that if we satisfy them and they have very specific needs, you know, that's movies. You end up, there end up being a number of people that have to be satisfied in order for it to, in order for those millions of dollars to get spent. So we're trying to satisfy them. Um, I think we can do it. I think we can um, give them a, a version that is kind of what they're hoping for. And the guy, you know, Alex and Keanu are, are ready to go. And there's uh, Dean Pariseau, who directed um, Galaxy Quest with Alan Rickman and Sigourney Weaver. He's, you know, ready to direct. So, you know, with some luck, we'll get this thing filmed pretty soon. I think it's uh, it's just the perfect time for something like that to come back. I think there's a, a whole... Um, hunger for nostalgia in the air and we've seen that represented in cinema and, and TV now as it is and I think it'd just be excellent to see where these guys are in in 2016 we'd love to do it so I hope we get that chance and uh, I, I would love I would love to think you're right about that I read I don't know if you can confirm or deny this but I read a rumor that it's perhaps set in London is there any truth to this yeah, no, I mean, actually, there's not. I don't know really where that one came from. Yeah, it suddenly just sort of popped up, and, and I just, I don't have a clue where that one came from. No, that's not, that is not, as much as I am a uh, Anglophile, you know, and uh, so is Ed, my, my writing partner. Um, no. No? No. Never mind. Nope, sorry. So I can 
cross that question about being an extra off my <laughs> list then. Well, you know, if you wanted to, you know, fly to like, you know, uh, New Mexico or, or wherever we'd shoot it, then maybe, Stephen. Excellent. Okay, I'll hold you to that. Chris, okay. it's, it's been great to catch up with you. And I'm, um, I'm, I'll definitely, I think I'm going to actually read the story of God again. It, it made me laugh that much the first time round. Is there anything else you wanted to touch on that I've not brought up? Uh, I think we're good, man. Excellent. Okay, well, where's the best place for people to go to get a copy of your book? I, I, you, there's no digital fingerprint. You, you practically don't exist in the world if you're not on social I media. Do, I'm, I'm trying not to exist in the world, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, no, it's Amazon. Really. Amazon. I mean, Am, Am, Amazon's the place to get it. And also, I mean, if people had, if they bought the book, you know, um, and they don't want to... Uh, have to buy the uh, you know the paperback for to get the epilogue. They can just buy the epilogue um, on Kindle uh, alone. I think it's only like it's like two bucks, you know. So they can just buy that if they wanted to read that. Excellent. Okay, I'll make sure I point people towards that, Chris. It's it's been an absolute pleasure catching up with you again. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you to my excellent guest, Chris Matheson. Make sure you pick up a copy of The Story of God, available in fine bookstores everywhere and Amazon. You can keep up to date on this very podcast at gspellchecker.com. I think we've all learned something here today. 